Hey friends, Andy Jenkins here. I am going to continue talking today from the space that I began two episodes ago. We have been talking about the concept. This is really directed at men to lead strong, to love even stronger. So my, my goal to you in the argument is that as men, we don't really need to step back from leading uh, in the culture in which we find ourselves. So, so often people think, well, uh, men have led in abusive ways. Uh, that's true. Uh, men have led in unhelpful or even ungodly ways. That's true. Uh, men have led in such a way that we see over the past, you, ju you just look at the news for the past year, pastor after pastor after pastor has been, uh, you know, the culture would use this word, disqualified, based on infidelity and based on other indiscretions. And you say, well, that's that's true. But, but I think the remedy is not for men to stop leading, the remedy would be for men to lead in the same way that Jesus outlines in the scripture, which means you're probably going to lead even stronger than you've been leading before. You're going to step up to another level, elevate the game, but you're going to love even stronger than that. In the previous episode, we really went back to the book of Genesis. We looked at the fall we discussed the idea that Eve ate the fruit first. So technically, she sinned first. However, Adam was the one that had authority, and because of that, he had accountability, and because of that, he had responsibility. So God sought Adam after the fall. He didn't seek Eve. Uh, the New Testament, Romans 5.12, holds Adam responsible for, for the fall. It, it doesn't hold Adam and Eve jointly responsible. It doesn't blame Eve. It places it on the shoulders of the man. Now, this doesn't mean that he has the capacity uh, or the call to dominate her. Not, not at all. It doesn't mean she's second rate. Not, not at all. The, the, the one that was called to lead uh, should be, according to Jesus, the biggest servant. The one who would be the, he even uses the word Lord or master, should be the slave is the term he uses, the slave of all. And so it, it just really leads me to think that's, that somehow, because he saw it in such a different way than we see it, and because uh, in Scripture when someone's leading, they, they get burdened not with the what do I gain as the leader. They, they get burdened or saddled with what do I give because I'm the leader? What's my responsibility because I lead? And in a couple of weeks, we're going, to, we're going to see as I get to more episodes on this that I really think women can lead too. And there, there are episodes all throughout the New Testament where women lead in these culturally crazy ways. Uh, in the New Testament, and they set up the paradigm whereby women should be able to do far more than than we allow and empower them to do, uh, especially in the church today. You, you read through the New Testament, you see that women actually taught some of the apostles. You read through the New Testament, there's this one episode, I can't wait to share this one with you, where uh, Jesus does women's work, and the women do things that, culturally speaking, would have been reserved for men. So the lines aren't as tidy and cozy as we typically make them. Um, anyway, the, the whole idea here, I can't answer all of that, and I'm probably going to create more questions than provide answers. The whole idea here is, is men, to really step up your game. Your game involves you leading strong, not weak, and loving even stronger. Uh, by, by the way, four minutes in, long introduction there. I would encourage you to go down into the show notes below. There's a link where you can get the audiobook to a book that I put out this summer. Just quietly dropped it out when I was going to speak at a church about this concept. Uh, there is the audiobook absolutely free. You can get the paperback book. I'm happy to, to send it to you if you buy it. Um, but the audiobook, it's, it's just digital air. You, you can have it totally free, and then you can accelerate ahead of what we're talking about here. You can review it, rewind it as many times as you want. All of that is there for you. Now, in, in this episode, here's, here's the work I want to do. In the previous episode, I said, if, if we're created in God's image, male and female, we're, we're different, but we are both created in God's image. 
The man was formed from the dirt. The woman was fashioned. That's a higher degree of artistic care and precision. She was fashioned from the rib of the man. So two different words going on there. The woman is the crown of creation. Uh, if we are created in God's image, and since we are different, I really believe it takes both of us together, the man and the woman, to see the complete image, the complete picture of the Godhead. The man doesn't have it alone. The woman doesn't have it alone. Somehow, there's something that we both supply there. We're better together. And as I closed out the previous episode, I really said that in the marriage relationship, rather than getting into this unhealthy spin cycle of domination and defiance, domination and defiance, and, and it can happen either way. The, the woman can dominate and the man defy, or the man can dominate and the woman defy. Rather than getting that crazy spin cycle and spending more time fighting than we do finding and fulfilling our purpose individually and our purpose together as a couple, uh, or Rather than a lot of times what happens is people don't get into that spin cycle, one just completely disengages to where you have one partner that's raising the kids, they're managing the load at the house, and the other one just, you know, men, men typically get busy in video games or hanging out with the guys. And it's not that hobbies are necessarily bad, it's just they, they can become a total checkout. Work can become a complete checkout from arguably your greater calling of the people that God has given you. Uh, said, anyway, we want to pull together and see the complete image of God in us together. And to do that, we really need to look at the Trinity, at the Godhead. Okay, so let me start walking through this. Here is the premise Men and women are equal, absolutely, but they are different. Uh, the woman, again, was fashioned from the side of the man who was formed from the dirt. She was taken not from his head so that she would rule over him. She was not taken from his feet so that he could trample over her. I think we see a complete uh, image there of what should happen. She is taken from the side to walk beside him. He's to walk beside her, not one in front of the other. The fall causes, I believe, women to want to dominate men, and it causes men to desire to trample women. That was not God's design. She was created as a partner, as a, the New Testament actually uses the word, and the Old Testament uses the word helper. Now, that word helper, a lot of people look at that and go, oh, no, 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 it's a bad word. It's the same word that Jesus used of the Holy Spirit. Um, it is the word that God used in Genesis 2.18 when the woman was sent to be the helper to the man in Genesis 2.18. Uh, the Holy Spirit, again, John 14.26, sent to be the helper to the Christian. We see this word helper. God is referred to as our helper in Psalms 28.7 and Psalm 54.4. Uh, in Hebrews 13.6, it even says God is our helper helper from the side to be at the side. Now, there is a great image that I think puts all of this in perspective. If you've been to a wedding, you've, you've probably been in a wedding as the featured person exchanging vows. Um, it's not uncommon in, in a wedding after the vows are exchanged for the minister to direct the bride and groom to a candelabra. Uh, the candelabra is typically uh, the focal feature, uh, most often during a song, after vows have been exchanged, the couple moves over. Uh, there's generally two candles that are lit. One was lit by the woman's mother. The other was set aflame by the man's mother. And then in unison, in that song, the bride and groom take hold of their respective candles and then together light an unlit candle that has been sitting at the top for the entire ceremony. You've probably seen it. Here's when something odd happens. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, it takes what all of 10 seconds to walk down from the platform to the candelabra and to light that middle candle. And then the couple stands there awkwardly as the song finishes. 
Not, not talking about that. Here's, here's what generally happens. Um, they light their candle and then they snuff out their candles, leaving a unity candle at the top as the solo flame. I think a better perspective of that is not to extinguish the flames, not to eliminate those flames. Here's why. Historically, the church has taught that marriage represents the Trinity. That's the three-in-one expression of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, in that relationship, historically speaking, the church has taught that the husband represents Christ and is called to love his wife as Christ loves his bride, the church. He's told to lay down his life for her even. Um, you see this in Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The wife represents the Holy Spirit. She's the one called to stand beside him in the same way the Holy Spirit comes beside us. Of course, her standing by his side also presumes that he is at the same time standing beside her. Uh, it's my experience, too, that women often share more in common with the Holy Spirit than men. They often hear God more clearly. They are gentle. They are pure. I, t I tell you this, Beth clearly hears the voice of God, and she will hear him in prayer, and she will write things in her journal that will come true months and years later in precise detail about me, about our kids, about our life together, about opportunities that we're going to experience. Again, the husband represents Christ. The wife represents the Holy Spirit. The Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, they are the ones that bind the relationship together. And in other words, marriage isn't just a legal agreement recognized by the laws of the land. It's primarily a supernatural covenant that's sealed in heaven. It's something bigger. So, in my opinion, because of all that, I think it's best to leave all three candles lit. They each represent a person as well as a facet of God's revelation to us. Now, let me read uh, Ephesians 5.22 for you because that, that really contains Paul's most lengthy teaching about all of this. And let's see if we can start putting some of this together. Here, here it is. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, now, every guy in my experience that is walking through a marriage landmine, self-included, <laughs> from stuff I've experienced, we all know that verse, wives, submit to your husbands. Let's keep reading, though. I want to highlight some things. Uh, for the husband is the head of the wife. We saw that phrase in the previous episode. Uh, as also Christ is the head of the church. So, so there becomes our model, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in, in everything. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband." Now, all that said, let, let me make a few observations here, and then we'll see how we can ap ap apply this. Uh, here's, I, I've got one, two, three, four, five little just bullet points here in my notes that I want, want to refer you to. First observation, the husband is the head because he represents Christ. Next observation, as such... 
He must love his wife in the same way to the same degree that Christ loves the church. That means the woman isn't there to serve the man any more than we exist as a church to meet the unmet needs of Jesus. He's there. The man is there to serve her. Okay, so that reframes the leadership headship equation completely. Next observation. We're reminded that the church is one with Christ. We are literally part of his body. Likewise, married couples are one. You're, you're, you're no longer two. Yet, yes, you're still individuals, but you're also simultaneously one. Next observation, Paul references Genesis 2.24 here um, in Ephesians 5.31. This is where God said the two will become one flesh. Okay, I'm going to come back to that in a moment because that phrase right there, one flesh, it is a loaded cannon, a stick of dynamite that is powerful about what we understand about the Trinity and about marriage. Uh, and then final observation before I come back to that is Paul makes it clear that while we're reading this passage, we tend to think that we're talking about marriage, but Paul is actually writing about Christ in the church. So we can't just extract marriage lessons out of this without overlaying the grid of Paul saying, hey, primarily the big lesson here is Christ and the church is Jesus and his bride. They're so interconnected that you, you can't just use this passage and go start start pontificating about the marital relationship. It's, 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 it's in the grid of the Godhead, just like that Trinity candle is in the framework of, of the Godhead. You, you can't just start blowing out candles. You can't just start cranking out verses and using Bible verses like bullets. Uh, let's go back to that observation here be, be, about the one flesh, because I, th I think that makes the point Paul's wrapping here. Uh, the Shema or Shema is the foundational confession of Judaism. You find it in Deuteronomy 6.4 where Moses writes, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, the word Shema means to hear, but not only to hear, it means to hear and to apply such that you live it out in every area of your life. So in this Shema, the great confession of Judaism, they're saying the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That word for one in the Hebrew language is echad. Uh, if you are transliterating it, now the Hebrew alphabet completely different. They don't even read left to right. They read right to left backwards from us in English. It, different alphabet, you're, you're transliterating it. It would be E-C-H-A-D. It is a different word than the numeral one. Echad means many who are one. It's, it's a relational expression of unity. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is many who are one, a relational expression of intense unity. Uh, th this is a unifying oneness that goes far beyond just being on the same page. It transcends just agreeing. It moves beyond just, well, let's just go along to get along and, and keep the pace. It is a cosmic union. It is an unbreakable tie. Now, Paul uses the same imagery in multiple places throughout the New Testament. He, he reminds us, different word, because the New Testament's in Greek, but he reminds us, Colossians 1.27, we are one with Christ. So, so you and I, brothers and sisters in Christ, believers, one with Christ. We are, 1 Corinthians 6.17, one with the Holy Spirit. Again, it's this relational oneness such that you, you don't know where one stops and the other starts. They're clearly two different units. They have their own identity, yet there is this, at the same time, this, this blur, this unbreakable, cosmic, supernatural, transcendent oneness. Uh, Galatians 3.28 says, we are one together in the larger body of Christ. Now, if you go all the way back to the Old Testament, 
Genesis 2.24, in the creation narrative, God declares that a man and a woman become one with each other. They become echad with each other in the same way that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Many who are one. Um a man shall leave his father and mother, Genesis 2.24, and the two shall become one flesh. They, they shall become many who are one. It transcends being on the same page. It transcends agreement. It transcends just walking through life and keeping the peace and managing a budget and bills and raising kids together. It is a many who are one like Deuteronomy 6, 4. With God at the center, they are now one. It is a, oh, it, it's this extraordinary picture that Paul picked up on, again, in that Ephesians 5 passage, when we think he's talking about a husband and wife. We think he's saying, hey, uh, husbands do this because wives are are doing this, and husbands do this, and wives, you do this. And then he, he says, although we thought he was talking about marriage, we, it, it's, it's this, he pulls it back and says, wait, I was actually speaking about what God is like, and what the two of you do together is your marriage illustrates and says something bigger than the marriage itself. Now, here's what's really interesting. A, a couple moments ago, I said that, you know, every guy, let me turn back to it, knows that verse, Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. But in the verses immediately preceding that and preceding this longer passage, he tells us how to create an atmosphere in which this one thrives. Um he, he describes it like this in Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. So three verses just ahead of this marriage guide passage. He says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God, and then he says, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Now, now, catch all of that again. Be filled with the Spirit. Like, this is the atmosphere that he wants in your house. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, I tell you, like, Beth is incredible with this. Submitting to one another in the fear. Uh, we're going to come back and talk about that word <laughs> later on down the road uh, in another episode. Because it is a beautiful term. Submitting to one another in the reverence, in the awe of God. So Paul says, submit to one another. Uh, and th that is, both of you live in such a way that you consistently seek the needs of the other person above your own, promoting them and the purposes God planned for them. And when you pull it back, remember, he says, hey, I'm really talking about the Trinity here. I'm really talking about God and Christ and how he relates to the church. This is how the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, this is how they express themselves throughout the Scripture. So if you read through the New Testament, let, let me give you just a couple of observations. A couple things that you'll see. You'll see that Jesus always submitted to the Father. Uh, Jesus, according to his own testimony, he only did what he saw the Father doing, John 5, 19. Uh, he only spoke what the Father said, John 14, 10. He revealed the Father completely. That's Colossians 1, 15, Hebrews 1, 3, Luke 10, 22. He provides the exclusive path to the Father, John 14, 6. He endeavors to connect people to the Father, ensuring that everyone... Every one of God's spiritual sons and daughters finds their way home. That's John 10, 27 through 29. But Jesus wasn't alone in this effort. 
the Spirit worked with Jesus, empowering Jesus every step of the way. Uh, furthermore, the Holy Spirit never pointed to the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus never pointed to himself. The Spirit always diverted attention to Jesus. So the Spirit testified of Jesus, John 16, 13. The Spirit didn't testify of the Spirit. The Spirit was sent by the Father at the request of the Son. That's John 14, 14, Luke 17, 26. The Spirit even now provides us recall of what Jesus taught and did, John 15, 26. That is, the Spirit reminds us of Jesus' words and his works. Uh, the Spirit bears witness and reminds us over and over that we are God's children and that he loves us. That's Romans 8, 12 through 17. Uh, we also read finally <laughs> that, and, and this reminds me of Proverbs, it says, he who finds a wife finds a good gift of God, we read that the Holy Spirit is a gift, Acts 2, 28. So let me pull some of this together. Thus far, we've seen that the Son went to the Father. We've seen the Spirit pointed to the Son. But I want you to notice the Father didn't just absorb the attention. The Father promoted the Son. So throughout the New Testament, we read truths like, uh, no one comes to the Son unless the Father draws him. That's John 6, 44, Luke 10, 22. We read that the Father loves the Son and gives the Son all things. That's John 5, 20 and John 3, 35. We read that everything is delivered by the Father to the Son. It's Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27. And that the Father gave the Son all authority. That's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The Father delegates all judgment to the Son, John 5, 22. The Father elevated the Son's name and reputation based on his servanthood and humility, according to Philippians 2, 5 through 11. In other words, we don't observe any self-promotion in the Trinity, and we shouldn't see any self-promotion in marriage. Now, in an earlier talk, I believe it was the previous one, I suggested that fractured relationships is one of the results of the fall. And rather than leading like Jesus, men dominate the women that they should serve and protect. And rather than empowering and deferring like the Holy Spirit, women defy the men that, that should graciously love them as Christ loved the church. Again, the Trinity is the model and when Paul described marriage, he said, hey, whoa, whoa, okay, the lines are really blurred here. You think I'm talking about marriage, but I'm really talking about God, and I'm talking about how Christ relates to the church. So if you look back at the list of, of, of what I just outlined, those, I, I believe, start giving us the starting point for job descriptions for men and women. Uh, the, the man, you, should seek to embody how Jesus lived. The, the woman seeks to embody the role of the Holy Spirit. The goodness of God the Father makes all of this possible. The goodness of God the Father makes all of this work. Now, in this, let, let me close with maybe an admonition and encouragement to men. Because the Apostle Peter, he reminds us that men and women are different. Paul reminds us that men and women are different. In our culture, we've gotten to all this gender bending and all of this nuance that's so, I mean, goodness, like something I read several weeks ago said that people now believe, some people believe there are now 57 genders. I, I only know of, of two. Um, Peter reminds us that of those two, men and women are different, and that men, by the very way that God made them, are stronger. Uh, just like the title of the book uh, and the audiobook link that's down below that's free, just like really kind of the title of this series of, of talks or uh, really the uh, phrase we keep repeating, which is lead strong, love stronger. Uh, Peter says this in, in 1 Peter 3, 7. He says, read it, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them. Dwell with your wives, the women, with understanding, 
giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. Uh, Now, that's a loaded word right there, just like helper. Giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, the word used here in this passage, weaker, it doesn't mean that women are physically less muscular than than men, even though on average, we could observe that and say that is true, even though uh, genetically, biologically, that seems to be the norm, even though genetically, biologically, if they bury 50 men and 50 women in a grave 100 years from now, archaeologists will go to those graves and they will be able to identify based on bone structure and every other way that we are made, which one of those 50 to the person were biological men at birth and which one to the person were at birth women, regardless of of what modifications that we make along the way. Peter's choice here doesn't denote a physical strength, even though that's true. His word choice denotes that women are, beautiful word here, porcelain. Uh, Or to say it another way, whereas men are physically more robust, they're utilitarian, they're steady, uh, more more like a thermos, li- like a Yeti cooler. <laughs> That's a word not used in the Bible, of course. Women are porcelain. Women are like fine china. Women are exquisite. Remember, men were formed from dirt. Women were fashioned with more precision and care from the side of men. And as a result, they... The final thing that was created in the entire created order are the crown of creation. Men owe women a debt of honor. 1 Peter 3, 7. That's what he says. Honor the wife. Honor the women. Uh, Peter also reminds us that women are heirs together with men. Now, in our culture, we likely completely miss the nature of what he means there. Uh, Jewish men in Peter's day prayed multiple times a day, though. Multiple times. I thank God that I am not a slave, a Gentile, or a female. And they would just repeat it. I thank God that I am not a slave, a Gentile, or a female. Why? Because slaves were property, Gentiles were pagans, and women were, in the minds of most people, second-rate, subpar humans. Uh, Women were not allowed to serve as eyewitnesses in court because they were believed to be too emotional and unreliable. That's one of the things that makes the resurrection accounts all the more believable because if the disciples were lying about Jesus rising from the dead, they would have never written the script to include the women. It would have made their claims less credible, culturally speaking. Uh, Women were also not allowed to own property. Many men believed that they were property. This makes it all the more remarkable that a handful of women, not men, funded Jesus' ministry according to Luke 8, 1 through 3. Here, though, in this passage, 1 Peter 3, 7, Peter reminds us, like Paul, that in the kingdom of God, things are different. Women are not subpar. Women are not second rate. They are porcelain. They are due honor. They are heirs. Furthermore, the the reason many of the men feel that their prayers hit the ceiling and then just bounce back. (laughs) You you ever thought that? Peter would say, hey, it, it might be because of the climate that you've created, and it might be just maybe because of the lack of grace and the honor for the women that are in your life. In, in other words, he, w- he would say this. Peter would say, men, you are stronger so that you can defeat the enemy. Um, rather than allowing the woman who is weaker to go head to head with that enemy. Um, men, you are stronger so that you can impart, embrace, and love the women. Men, you are stronger so that you can reverse the curse and set things back in order as Jesus did, even at the cost of laying down your life. Men, you are stronger 
so that, here's, we'll close with this. You can stand against a culture which belittles women and elevate them back to God's creation intention of joint heirs, the jewel, the crown of creation. You see it? It it is so good, so rich, so deep, so intertwined with with our identity in Christ that, that, that Paul, when he's writing about marriage, he says, wait, you thought I was writing about marriage. I probably actually thought I was writing about marriage too, but I'm really writing about Christ and I'm writing about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I'm writing about the way He interacts with us. And when you understand that, you understand that you're both part of the image of God. You are image bearers together, and that marriage relationship, it says something. It demonstrates something bigger beyond the two of you. You got it? Okay. In the next episode, I'll be back. Uh, it'll be a week from now. I will be back and we will start talking about, all right, what, what does all of this have to do? Let's just get into it. Church world. All right. We'll talk about it then. I'll see you soon.